stage because it gave the country a good civil service with very little corruption. And still, Denmark, together with Finland, uh, we are the least corrupt countries in the world. And we owe part of this to the rather gentle and enlightened absolute monarchy we had since 1660. In spite of the fact that the kings were really no good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always say there were two problems in Danish history, always. One was the southern border uh, with Germany, the other was bad leadership. But thanks to the civil servants, we were able to survive uh, one terrible king after the other. <laughs> we cherish uh, uh, King Christian IV. We cherish him. We celebrate. I mean, he also built this. He built that. Um, he, he was a very good architect. At least he knew about architecture. But he lost all his wars and ended up making a great power into a, a quite small power. And in the end, how tragic, he was even defeated in bed. <laughs> no more about that. There were some, some counseling bodies. But the reason why the Danish kings and governments resisted genuine democracy they had genuine democracy since 1814 in Norway, in Belgium since 1830. But in Denmark, we were waiting. Why? Because of the southern border. Because if we had democracy, the German part of the kingdom would immediately rebel, would immediately claim independence. Which is exactly what they did in 1849, when we finally got a free constitutional state, or at least they wanted independence, so it ended up in a, in a three years war, uh, which ended with a draw. Uh, there were really no winner because uh, Russia and Britain and the other great powers, they didn't want to change anything. They wanted to keep Denmark as a multinational state, including Iceland and Greenland and the Faroe Islands, etc. So nothing came out of it, but, but the fighting was quite immense. Uh, there was a big battle uh, in the middle of Schleswig between uh, 50,000 Danish soldiers and 40,000 Schleswig Holstein soldiers. And it was more or less a Danish victory, but nothing came out of it. Then, 40 years later, in 1864, the war broke out again because the Danish government and the new Danish parliament, they made a new constitution where they included Schleswig in the kingdom and uh, threw Holstein out. But of course, the southern part of Schleswig was German. So again, the Germans, was Denmark lost, and uh, uh, for strange reasons, the Danish government and the Danish king did not want to partition, to divide this. I mean, that was the obvious uh, solution, to divide this, to take the Danish part, and that was an option. But they refused, and this is really like a Greek tragic drama. Because the Democrats in Denmark, led by Mr. Monheim, he would have liked a partition and a Nordic Union. Those who were filled with these new ideas about nationality, they wanted a partition of Schleswig and the Nordic Union. But the king was totally against that because the king was actually German. <coughs> and uh, he wanted to keep the whole. He, he was brand new because 
the former uh, line of kings had died out, so he came from a new branch of the royal family. If the Democrats had been allowed to have it their way, there wouldn't have been a war either. But the fact that they blocked each other, you know, it's like you can imagine the king sitting, playing this, uh, so that it all ends up in a Greek uh, tragedy. But why did you invite a German to become king? It was, it was not very clever to invite a German to become the new king. Well, the Danish royalty was uh, for centuries half German. I chose a king from Slesvig. Then, I mean, his wife and his beautiful daughter, as they ought to go to. And by the way, his daughters, they ended up as Empress of Russia, as uh, Queen of Britain. Dagmar and Alexander, Fyodor Roman and Alexander, and they were his daughters. And I think the Romanian Greece, throne in Greece, yes. So he ended up being the father-in-law of, of the entire European continent. And they thought that this would protect Denmark. But a country that breaks its treaties, I mean, no one could come to our rescue. So even those those queens who were daughters of the Danish king, they couldn't go because these stupid Democrats, they broke the treaty without wanting to divide uh, Slesvig. Well, enough of that. Those Democrats then were blamed for the whole defeat, therefore the constitution was changed. Uh, and power was taken away from the lower chamber and given to the upper chamber. That started a 25 years of conflict because then the king governed by means of the upper chamber against the lower chamber. And in the end, the Conservative Party, which was his backup, they only had eight seats in the lower chamber. Then they gave up finally in 1901. So we only had had real democracy since 1901. And then the lower house took revenge. They abolished the upper house. <laughs> that, is, that is why we, we have a unicameral system. Yeah. In short. 1915, look at the, the procession. That is when women got the right to vote. And we're going to celebrate that on the 5th of June, this song. That will be a big celebration. And apart from this procession, <coughs> there also was another procession to the king, led by my wife's great-grandmother. <laughs> she was old, she was heavy, and when she came to the tall king, the Christian Patent, she kneeled, you know, and she couldn't get out again. <laughs> so, so she said, help me, your majesty. <laughs> and then he pulled her up. <laughs> so that is uh, the part my family played in the democratic history of Denmark. But this same king, in fact, never really, he had contempt of democracy. Uh, so he made a coup d'etat in 1920. But then, uh, there was very much shouting in the streets of Copenhagen, Republic, we want Republic. And he got scared, and then he made his own lawyer prime minister. So that was a Danish compromise, and then he appointed his own lawyer. This is the second time a Danish king appoints his own lawyer to be prime minister. Typical Danish compromise. <laughs> um, he still uh, christened the 10th he got his good reputation from the fact that when Denmark was occupied in 1940, then he continued riding on horseback through the streets of Copenhagen. And there's a beautiful story saying that um, in, in America particularly, saying that when the Germans ordered the Jews to wear the Jewish star, then the king also was carrying the Jewish star on his uniform. I have to admit, 
that story is not true. <laughs> but the little element of truth in it is that in the Gothenburg newspaper, there was a cartoon describing how the Danish king said to the Danish prime minister, who asked, what if they will ask the Danish Jews to wear a Jewish tie? And then the Danish king replies, well, then we all will have to wear that star. But it's from a cartoon in Gothenburg. <laughs> it never happened because the Germans, they never ordered the Danish Jews to wear the star. Uh, we always got special treatment. Also, when some of the, a few of the Jews did not get to Sweden, they ended up in German concentration camps, but they got special treatment. Maybe, well, it could be for racist reasons. But they were very tough on the Norwegian Jews because the Norwegians were fighting in the war. Denmark accepted a so called peace occupation, and Denmark kept. Unfortunately, we were the seventh <laughs> largest slave nation. And a lot of money, yes, from, Africa, from Ghana. Ghana was a Danish colony called the Golden Coast, and also in Tangaba in India. And the slaves, most of them were taken to the West Indies, the Virgin Islands, where all street names and everything is still Danish. Uh, that castle burnt, unfortunately, and then after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, the new castle was built, and that was a very cheap one. Uh, so, thank God, it burnt also <laughs> in 1848. And that was during the fight between the king and the conservatives on the one side, and my party went on the Liberals on the other side. And because of that fighting, uh, my party didn't want, didn't want a new building. Why should we have a new parliament when there's no democracy? My party argued. So therefore, this car only came up in 1928. When some days think that Denmark has invented democracy, that is Putin. We could not have been the beginning because of the southern border and the Those who are citizens, they are invited to come here. And after the celebration, they are invited to come to come and visit the family. Isn't that a sad story? And 
It's very interesting to read his letters to his wife. He was convinced that he was a savior. Mm. He was a savior. And he was very honest, very good man. And he was sure that when he went up against the lower chamber, it was for the sake of the country. And maybe the history books will give him more, more of a place than that we have done so far. Maybe. These are the men who gave the women to go to the voting rights in 1950. Uh, uh, this is the first Liberal Prime Minister from my party. He was so unfortunate that his Minister of Justice turned out to be a thief and a terrible person, Alberti. So he had to leave office <coughs> quite early. Yeah. We have in Danish democratic history, we have had two ministers who really violated the law. Oh, Unfortunately, they were both ministers for justice. <laughs> <laughs> both Strange, isn't it? Yeah. Both of your party? 